Okay. Well, hello everyone. And I want to thank you not for inviting me here to speak. It's an honor. And uh, this is a unique uh, lecture for me, even though I've been lecturing and teaching for 60 years, uh, because it's the first time I've done a PowerPoint mm -hmm. uh, to call very support. And uh, this is also a, going to be a unique macrobiotic lecture because the main course does not include brown rice and beans, but a serving of non-duality flavored by George Osawa's points of view. <laughs> and um, uh, I like to uh, start by looking at the title of the talk. If you notice the word judgment, is there. We're talking about the seven levels of judgment. So what does the word judgment mean? Uh, it means a decision. You make a decision. And when you make a decision that in effect is a perception and a choice, and to make a perception and a choice requires awareness. Awareness. Judgment involves awareness, and awareness is the definition of consciousness at the uh, relative world, dualistic world level. Level. So when I use the word judgment, I'm considering it to be the equivalent of consciousness, and I know that uh, it's not in total agreement with, uh, with respect to that word, but that's the way I interpret it, and. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I think we ought to change the slide and move to my book. That's the next slide. And um, there's a question at the top. What is the difference between heaven and nirvana? I got to get rid of something here. Okay. And um, heaven is a meta. Oh, by the way, the title of the book is Heaven and Nirvana. And please notice the subtitle duality and non-duality in the world's religions. Okay, heaven is a metaphor for a dualistic reality. And in theological terms, uh, the con a dualistic, uh, the, well, the Abraham religions, um, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam uh, are, their mainstream traditions are dualistic and in, promote the concept of salvation of a soul that survives the death of the body and uh, hopefully it goes to heaven instead of the other place and the uh, the key thing to understand here with that belief system is that the soul is separate from god or from the devil if you happen to go to the other place and it's multiplicity so you have uh, many things and separation. And these are the hallmarks of a dualistic situation. Now, nirvana is a metaphor for non-dualistic reality. And this has to do with the concept of liberation, whereby the consciousness that survives death of the body merges with the absolute and is liberated from rebirth because every birth and has suffering as the Buddha taught. And uh, I like to share for a, a story about a boat ride, which will give context to this talk uh, I'm trying to deliver about duality and non-duality. Buddhism has a beautiful metaphor about the journey, the psychological spiritual journey is traveling from the shore of duality and pain across the ocean of trouble to the other shore of liberation and no suffering. And the boat the Buddhists used to cross the ocean is the eightfold, called the Eightfold Path. Well, in macrobiotics in George Osawa's tradition, the name of his boat is to ascend the seven levels of consciousness. And if we do that, we can leave the dualistic land of, that always includes some suffering and hopefully a little joy and sail to the other shore. I'm also going to uh, discuss uh, 
uh, Vedanta. Let's turn. Let's go to the next slide, and uh, Vedanta, because they also have a boat across the ocean, and it's called the Spiritual Yoga's Book. Of it. And uh, let's talk about Vedanta. I'm sort of, I'm always curious to ask the audience how many have heard the term. And um, why is Vedanta important in this discussion with uh, that is focused on George Osawa's seven levels of consciousness? Well, Vedanta is the granddaddy of all the non-dual religions and philosophies. Uh, and this is very important. And the, the name Vedanta is interesting. About 1200 years before Christ, uh, 3000 years ago, the first uh, Veda, the Rig Veda was starting to be composed and put together. And eventually four Vedas were developed with four parts. And the last parts were the Upanishads. And the Upanishads, are the, I call the, the founding seeds of non-dual uh, philosophy and religion. They were written roughly from 800 BC to about 300 BC. And, um, and I was lucky in 1954, through a series of uh, coincidences, I was recommended to go hear the Swami talk at the Berkeley Vedanta Center that you see right in front of you. It was started in 1939, uh, I heard the lecture, I was 22, and, I, and if you're counting, I'm 91 right now. Um, and I heard the Swami speak, and it was a wonderful speak, uh, lecture about reality and the infinite, unchanging uh, universe, etc. And then afterwards, when I really thought about it, I realized I truly did not understand exactly what he was talking about but I knew it was the truth for me, which is a personal thing. And it resonated with me and uh, affected me uh, the rest of my life. And um, the, uh, let me just give you a brief summary of some of Vedanta's main ideas so we can align them and compare them to Osawa's. Uh, Vedanta, postulates, a, a non-dual Vedanta, I should say, the three types, postulates that there's a non-dual reality, which they like to refer to often as pure consciousness. And this absolute reality of consciousness is also who we really are. It is also, it's identical with our higher nature. My highest nature is the same as the absolute reality. Your higher nature is also my identity with that highest nature. So your identity and my identity are the same and both of our identities are the same as the absolute. And so this is oneness in a way. Uh, I have to cheat and use a dualistic language to try to point toward the non-dual. And if this sounds rather obscure, uh, please be patient. We're going to open this up and unpack it a lot more as we go. But the main thing is, uh, Vedanta gives the philosophy of non-duality and of oneness. And its main tools, its main practices in order to achieve that consciousness is to practice the four spiritual yogas. Yoga is much more than exercise, the hatha yoga. Uh, so, okay. Let's go on to the next uh, slide and uh, hold on a minute. I got, I'm learning PowerPoint. Please indulge me. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, the next slide. I was very happy that 30 years later, say 1954, uh, we now jump ahead 30 years in my life and it's the mid eighties. And that's when I started attending the camps the Macroboy camps at French Meadows, which were a wonderful blessing indeed. And here are four pictures uh, of the group at, at French Meadows, usually around 100, 110 people would attend. And, uh, and I was very happy to discover there that macrobiotics was much more than a diet. 
there were quite a few lectures covering the other dimensions. And to understand that George Osawa also had profound thoughts about the creation of the universe and philosophy and how to live your life. Uh, and uh, that was very, very thing because he pointed us to the absolute. Let's uh, go to the next slide. Well, what's that? That's a mirror. I want to ask you a question. Have you ever seen your face directly? I postulate you have never seen your face directly. You always have seen a reflection of your self. This is how it is with the absolute non-dual reality. Uh, you cannot recognize or experience it with the cognitive mind. You cannot know it by thinking and thought and reasoning. You have to go to either meditation and quiet the mind or have a transcendental experience. Or if you're very lucky, perhaps there'll be a grace and it will come to you and you will understand. But this is a very difficult thing. And uh, even the Bible even says, can you see the face of God and still live? Anyway, let's push on to the next slide and ask a, a very important question. Is there more than one reality? Of course, I've been alluding to the fact that there is. Hardcore materialists, they say there's only one reality, reality and it's physical. Many objects, multiplicity, dualistic. That's hardcore materialism. Mystics and non-dualist uh, philosophers and what have you describe another intangible reality uh, that's in essence non-dual and Osawa aligned himself with the mystics and we'll get to his let's go to the next uh, slide by the way I'm looking forward to having a lot of discussion after I talk and because I think inter interaction is the way the best way to learn this material so so after asking the question what is reality well what is duality and non-duality that you're talking about as possible realities um, so there is the dualistic relative world of multiplicity change and impermanence well you can it's you, we can know it by the mind we experience it every day and our e lower ego, self-centeredness, small s self develops during this time. We have joy and pain, always suffering. And this, uh, let's look at this carefully. Multiplicity, this is very important. The formal um, uh, definition of duality is more than one. And, and the thing to understand is that everything in this world changes and is impermanent. Everything is, in tra is, in, is transitory, including our bodies, which Madame Blavatsky called our mortal caskets. And, the, uh, and Buddha taught us that if you hang on to things that are impermanent, and you grasp them, like I'm grasping my wrist now, if I hold on tight and I try to turn my hand, my wrist, it causes friction. So as long as we grasp at things that are impermanent and transitory, we will suffer. Impermanence, I believe personally, is the foundation stone of Buddhist philosophy. That's the great insight. Um, now, there, so that's one well, that is duality in a nutshell. Now there's also the absolute world of infinite pure consciousness. Once again, the formal definition of non-duality is not two, but uh, that's sort of abstract or oneness. The main thing to understand about this world, it's not knowable, knowable by our cognitive mind. By the way, I'm gonna repeat several points several times during this talk, because I think there, there need to be firmly in place um, 
This is also, this consciousness is also our higher self, which I mentioned before. And if we can attain this, and we can enter a state of bliss and non-suffering. I think this is a, no, a good opportunity for me to insert at this point um, the four yogic consciousness states. Now remember that yoga is the practice tool, the practice arm of Vedanta, the oldest non-dual tradition as far as I can tell. The first conscious state is what's going on with us right now. There's me, Alex, talking, and there's you listening. And we're both awake, I hope, and <laughs> the uh, and we interact with each other, and that's a conscious aware and waking consciousness. The next, and it's dualistic, of course, because there's more than one. Then inevitably we go to sleep and we have some dreams. So there's the dreamer and what and the dream, more duality. So the first two yoga consciousness states are dualistic. Then we get to the third state, which is very interesting. Sleeping without dreams, a dreamless state. Where do we go when we're in deep sleep? Where is our consciousness? Is, is, uh, it's a very profound question. The sages and the rishis and the high yogis in the Upanishads describe this state as sort of like, I'll put it in my own terms, you're knocking on the door of the ultimate absolute reality, which is the fourth state of consciousness is called Turiya, it's the absolute. Uh, you can call it Nirvana, it has a lot of names, but these are the four states and the last two are considered non-dualistic. Okay, let's push on to the next slide. Who are some of the other players that speak of non-duality as a possible explanation of reality? Well, I have to go to my fellow Greek, Plato. And here, Plato, one of his main teachings was the idea that all the things of the material universe had in an abstract way, someplace forms or ideas, and these forms and ideas were the essence and true nature of what's experienced in the material world. And so this is why Plato was often called the ultimate dualist. You got something in the abstract universe that's the essence of things in the material plane. Well, that's very important to understand. The ultimate, source of all the ideas and forms come from the concept of the good. The concept of the good is the source of all the forms and ideas of Plato. And if you're interested in more about this, the Thelma Suzuki, she died a few years ago was out at 96. She was an outstanding philosophy professor, expounds on this beautifully. And, um, oh, by the way, this reminds me, my email address is alex.pappas at yahoo.com. And if things come to you and you want to email me and discuss something, I'd be very happy to respond. Now, another, let's go to theology. Meister Eckhart, about a thousand years ago, he was in trouble. He was a Catholic priest, monk, scholar, renowned, very important person. But he got in trouble because he asked the question, where did God come from? So he decided God came from the Godhead. Well, his Godhead is pure consciousness. It's our non-dual state. And he um, was, got in big trouble and the Inquisition uh, convicted him of heresy. And he was in Southern France and he was in his 60s waiting for his appeal at the Vatican to, uh, so he wouldn't get killed, executed or burned. And happily for him, he died a peaceful death because the Vatican turned down his appeal. And he, so he died properly. Uh, Eckhart is quite important. Now in the world of Western philosophy, uh, 
Uh, one of my favorites is Immanuel Kant, and Kant tried to reconcile reason and sensation. And, and he said that there's a phenomenal world, the dualist, he didn't use the word term dualistic, but I will, the dualistic phenomenal world we can know with our mind. But he said there's an essence to this universe and we cannot know it with our mind. We can never know the true underlying essence, the substratum of the physical world. And he called it the noumena. Uh, and other, he also call, referred to it as the thing in itself. If you see the word noumena or the thing in itself, they're almost like cold words, in my opinion, uh, of the non-dual state. By the way, I wanna say two things. Duality and non-duality are value-free concepts. One is not better than the other. And that's very important to understand. And, uh, and I also wanna emphasize, I'm giving you a lot of my opinions and people don't agree with everything I say all the time by any means. Now, the fourth person I like to mention, of course, is George Osawa. And, what it, and he had certain things to say about duality and non-duality which are on the next slide, and let's go to that. George Osawa took a world tour in around 1954, 56, et cetera, and he spent almost two years in India. And I think while he was there, I'm guessing that he encountered Vedanta, non-dual Vedanta. And he wrote a book about Gandhi, and on page 125 at camp, my wife happened to find this quotation um, in that book that George Osawa wrote. And I'd like to read that to you very slowly and make a few comments on the way. Here's George Osawa speaking. I cannot go into details here, except to say that after the sixth level of consciousness, I'm adding, which is the highest way of looking at the relative world. The relative world is the world of duality, whereas relationship, I'm fatter than you, you're taller than me, et cetera, et cetera, all kinds of relationships, which is the highest way of looking at the relative world. Judgment, consciousness breaks loose from the relative world altogether and enters into the absolute world. In the absolute world is no longer right or wrong, hot or cold, good or bad, light or heavy, easy or difficult, male or female. I like to add a footnote. Can you think of a concept that doesn't have an opposite? Okay. In the absolute world, there is no longer yin and yang or any version of it. Indeed, although the Orientals call it the seventh heaven, even the most ambitious words cannot describe the realm of the supreme judgment, the seventh level. Nevertheless, this is the realm that Gandhi sought to enter. Okay, let's go to the next slide. George Osawa was a stage theorist. His theory is based that consciousness develops in stages. And he postulated the first six stages are considered relative, dualistic condition consciousness. Uh, the, the six stages of relative judgment are dualistic and relative. And there are six here that develop during our lifetime. We can't spend too much time in them because we have a limited time here. Um, we learn and experience our body and instincts. Then, of course, we get acquainted with our senses and we seek sensual pleasure. Boy, at number two, that's the world of Ed Heyman, beautiful hotels in the Bahamas to go with your beloved and all of those things. We seek happiness, through the senses. And uh, well, I'll leave it up to you to, to evaluate that. Then the next level of consciousness, we're starting to become emotionally sensitive. 
Uh, I think somebody wrote a book recently about emotional maturity. And then after the emotional level, we go into the intellectual level and the realm of science and start thinking at that level and maybe requiring physical proof before we believe something. Then the next level of consciousness, when we come to understand the that social values of society and we conform to them to a large extent, when we don't, we have riots and disturbances. Uh, Okay, and then the next, the sixth level, we get creative. We start to create our own philosophy and points of view and create our own ideological ideas. And this is a very high state. But the all six stages, the first six stages are all part of the dualistic relative world. If you notice in every level, there's multiplicity and separation which are the hallmarks of a dualistic state of affairs. Okay. Then, going back to Osawa's statement, consciousness breaks loose from the sixth and leaps to the seventh level of judgment, pure consciousness. That is the non-dual and absolute. Here, of course, we cross the ocean. We're on the other shore. It's the end of suffering. And it's... Uh, answers the question, who am I? There's no you. There's the absolute, pure, non-dual consciousness. Okay, let's go to the next. Uh, uh, oh, by the way, I just want to make a comment. When a baby's born, it's at the seventh level, but the minute it starts to get conditioned by the world, it's no longer pure. Okay, let's... Um, what beliefs can help point us to the absolute reality? Well, what's your mindset? How, what do you do to get yourself ready to take a journey from suffering to non-suffering? Uh, what do you do? Um, well, I'll read this. Osawa and most non-dual religions and spiritual paths have all or most of the following beliefs, not knowledge. Remember, all of this is based on our beliefs and our intuition about the ultimate reality, the absolute. In other words, how do we move along on the path? First of all, it's a, we accept that there's the possibility it's a non-dual reality. And that non-dual reality is immutable. It doesn't change. It's not transitory. And also that the non-dual reality is the underlying substratum of our world that is beyond definition. And it is not know what a conceptual mind, but only by a direct experience beyond the mind. And for me, this, of course, is the height of the main purpose of meditation. And it's our true nature and it's our destiny. I, I like to go to that direct experience for a moment. The formal definition of yoga according to Patanjali, is chitta, vritti, narada. Chitta is the mind stuff. Vritti are the thoughts. Narada is a sensation. The cessation of thought is the height of the yoga practice where you enter the state of samadhi. And uh, this is where yoga practice comes in. Hatha yoga, which is done at camp, people teach it there. I used to be quite interested in that myself personally. But it, it's valuable in that the better shape and health you're in, uh, the easier it is to meditate in quiet, our busy mind so we can experience the other. Uh, okay, let's go. This is a little bit redundant and overlaps with the previous uh, slide, but I tried to break it down a little bit more. What values and belief can waken the supreme judgment? How do we make that jump from that sixth level of consciousness Osawa talks about and get into the seventh level? Uh, what, what does it take? Well, let me read this and then I'll make some comments. Ultimately, Osawa's own experiences and knowledge led him to emphasize the following values and belief for awakening the supreme judgment. The two key things, ahimsa, the principle of nonviolence, 
and diet. These are primary. And not, let's really focus on ahimsa for a moment. Ahimsa means nonviolence in your thoughts, your speech, and your actions. And these are primary. The offshoots of being able to practice nonviolence in those three ways, not where you develop your consciousness to the point you don't have that negativity at all, results in your ability to love unconditionally. That's a tough one. That's really hard. Can you love what you just think you despise at the present time, whether it's politics or something else personal? Unconditional love is part of the path. He also emphasized, Osawa emphasized non credo non-belief in other creeds. Trust your own experience. This makes me think of the Buddha. The Buddha, when he was on his deathbed, he told his disciples, be lamps unto yourself. Create your reality. Create your view. Trust yourself, your own experience. So they were very much in a line there. Another outcome of this, this state of consciousness is eternal gratitude. Be grateful for what you have. Don't complain about what you don't have. Stop grasping is the advice of Buddha and George Osawa and Vedanta. Out of this will also come humble, humbleness. There's no room for arrogance, and I know the answer. Humbleness, because that opens your heart. Also, we must practice justice with one another. That comes out of ahimsa and proper diet. And these are kind of conclusions now. We are one with the spiritual reality. Freedom and liberation are our destiny. These are repeats. Uh, okay, I want to stay here another moment. Nonviolence. Let's talk about yoga philosophy for a minute. Patanjali was one of the great yogic teachers and philosophers a couple of thousand years ago. And he developed eight steps on the path of yoga. And I'd like to discuss two, the first two in alignment with Ohamza, uh, Osawa's emphasis on ahimsa. The first two steps of Patanjali's eight steps of yoga are the yamas and the niyamas, the things you should do and you shouldn't do in order to make progress on the path. And so, and of course, in the yamas and the yamas, it's emphasized no violence. It's there. Then uh, the other six, uh, okay, well, let it go because that's too much. Um, uh, I also, when I first read the yamas and the niyamas, I started to think about the Bible and the Ten Commandments. But, uh, there's a little bit of the eye for the eye in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, uh, it's emphasized forgiveness turn the other cheek. It's not always okay. So let me see here. I'm looking over. Let's go on to the next slide. Uh, what is our existential problem? Maybe you didn't know you had an existential problem. Uh, have you ever noticed that sometimes when everything's perfect in your life and everything is really nice and you don't have any problems to deal with, that even then you experience some level of mild level of anxiety. Does your knee bounce up and down? Do you notice other people like that? Did, it, did your knee bounce up and down while I was talking? <laughs> okay. Um, so let's talk about the existential problem. There are two things we don't know which cause anxiety. And one, another thing we do know that causes anxiety. The two things we don't know are, we don't know for sure where we came from. How did this whole drama and movie, the universe can't come about? Science does great work. They've got us down to the singularity, but they can't tell us where that came from yet. As long as the paradigm is cause and effect, then you have an infinite regression. And I love science and I'm, so I have faith in them that maybe someday they'll come up with the answer. But remember, the word is faith, not knowledge. The other thing we don't know is why we're here. Why are we going through all this? 
So those are the two things we don't know. That, the thing we do know that causes us sometimes anxiety. We know we're mortal. We're going to die. And we hope we don't die painfully. And also we have a question I added to this. We want to know if there's life or consciousness after death. What other people say, atheists say death is the end of the story. The agnostics, the smart ones. <laughs> I don't know. We do live in a mystery. And dualists desiring salvation say our immortal souls end up in heaven or hell. And the non-dualists say our consciousness merges with the absolute. These are some ideas to think about. Let's go on to the next one. Um, I'm, I've kind of lost track of the time. How are we doing on time? Uh, uh, let me see. I think we're okay. Uh, we discussed Osawa's path. Both we climbed the seven. Yes. Excuse so, me. I was muted. We're doing fine on time. It's this is wonderful. Please continue. It's okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, see, we covered Sawa's, uh, our duty to climb the seven levels of consciousness in order to achieve kind of, some kind of freedom, some sorrow, suffering. I like to focus on the types of spiritual yoga because everybody thinks yoga, not everybody, but many people think yoga is exercise. And that's really good. I, that how the yoga is there, but these are uh, the different types of what I call spiritual paths of yoga. And in the paragraph, I'll read it again. Patanjali's definition of yoga, chitta, mind stuff, vrittis, thoughts, narada, cessation. The five primary type, primary yoga practices for spiritual development, and I will add psychological development are, Bhakti yoga, that is the path of devotion. The great yogis say this is the fastest way to liberation if you have this type of personality. This is, then this is found in almost all the religions of the world, prayer, chanting, uh, um, medit uh, uh, ch uh, chanting word of God, austerities, and what have you. Um, the next yoga is karma yoga, the path of service, action. Now this, we got to take a pause. There's a big difference between karma yoga as service and what they all call seva. Very often when we try do something good for someone or society, we like it to succeed, whatever our project is. We're attached to the outcomes. And also we usually like to get thanks for doing what we did do it, a pat on the back. Well, as long as you're attached to outcomes or need to be appreciated, that's wonderful, but that's called seva. A karma yogi is a consciousness of a person that is pure service. They don't think about accomplishing something to help other people. That's just their very being. And they are beyond the lower egocentric self and don't need a pat on the back to be appreciated. Have you ever said they didn't appreciate what I did? <laughs> and you got felt resentful. Well, that's nice. Keep on doing good seva. But if you graduate to karma yoga, you have a chance for liberation. Now, the third spiritual yoga is called the yama yoga. This is a path of self-knowledge. And a great yogi who died around 1950, Ramana Maharshi, and at his ashram in India, uh, he didn't create yana yoga has been around for hundreds of years um, but there were two practices to achieve uh, liberation by practicing yana yoga the first one is neti neti not this not that you keep trying everything to get free and have a happiness but somehow pure happiness in the relative world it seems to be an impossibility but you keep trying uh, one thing after another and the other thing that Ramana Maharshi emphasized at his ashram was another old practice called, who am I? You keep asking this question, who am I? And you, I'm my driver's license, I'm a school teacher, I'm a businessman, I'm a housewife, I'm a mother, I'm a father. You keep asking, who am I? And pretty soon, the only thing that's left is your divine nature, your higher consciousness which in yoga and Vedanta is called the Atman, but the Atman is not an mortal soul. 
It's just the pure consciousness of non-duality. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the so-called pure soul, uh, there is no pure soul or eternal soul. There's a great misunderstanding between Hinduism and Buddhism on this point. The, the thing that evolves and grows spiritually in, in Vedanta is what's called the jiva. And when you achieve uh, liberation and achieve oneness, you're known as a jiva, jivan mukti. Mukti means freedom. Uh, okay, so let's. For, so if you really want to know by the mind, try yana yoga. It's sort of the opposite of bhakti yoga, which is of the heart, and the karma, which is action doer. Here, now we go to the mind. Now let's go to raja yoga. I'm going to make a footnote here. It's very important. Raja and the yoga, you might think, is the newest of all the yogas. I give, there are many talks about this in disputes, but in around 1890 or so, Swami Vivekananda, the great yogi who brought Vedanta to the West at the Parliament of Religions in 1893, he added an extra step to Patanjali's eight steps. Patanjali's last step was a subtle copy of Nirvana, which is a state you go into the absolute and come out of it, and there's still a trace of ego. Uh, Vivekananda added another step called Nerva Nirvana, Nerva Kapa Samadhi, where you are truly uh, liberated and merged with the absolute. And this, the, the main tool here, again, is meditation. Meditation and breath control, pranayama. Okay. Now, every Kundalini yoga seems to be, uh, uh, many people have heard the term and they've heard the term chakras. Kundalini yoga, um, I'm always a little ambivalent where to put it, but I'll list it here. And here the concept is our consciousness is at the base of our spine. That would be level one, George Osawa's uh, seven levels. And as we raise our consciousness, the energy goes up one of the three channels in our spine. The Sushuma is the main channel, and Idla and Pimbala, the two on each side. And as we increase our consciousness, the energy goes up, and hopefully it will reach our head and burst forth, not physically, of course, and uh, we have enlightenment and freedom and liberation. And this is where the chakras, which you all have heard about, come into play in the discussion of the Danta and yoga uh, uh, thing. Okay, um, I've kind of gone through, this, left out a lot of information about these things, but we have to be conscious of the time. So I would like to know, what are your, have you experienced a taste of the non-dual reality? And what are your questions? And uh, uh, and I'd like to see you now. <laughs> there you are. Alex. Hi, Mike. This is Mike. Uh, thank you for that wonderful introduction to the non-dual. I think that we've got not only from the Eastern standpoint, we've got it from the Western as well. We've got uh, Meister Eckhart, we've got Immanuel Kant. We're going to introduce the Hufeland, who wrote the original macrobiotic in, in the mid 1700s. We're going to get to that in the, in the next year or two. Today, you mentioned about the four yogas, the four consciousnesses of yoga, the first dualism, the dualism of wakefulness, the second dualism, that's the dualism of the dream, and then the third yoga the knocking on the door of the infinite, and then the fourth, and the fourth uh, yoga. The question is, 
what do those four yogas have to do or how do they relate to the four laws of Buddhism? You mean the four noble truths of Buddhism? Correct. Well, I have to think about that a minute. First truth is sufferings in the world. And I guess waking consciousness, we do experience suffering. And if we have nightmares, we have suffering in our dreams. But we do not have suffering in deep sleep and on the fourth level of Turiya. So I think that would be the best way to answer your question. It's very curious why both systems are using the number four. I don't know. It's very curious. And the Buddhists start explicitly with something that the, the this was the Upanishads. Is, is it, did that, do I remember correctly? Is that oh, what wait they- a minute, Wait a minute, Upanishads are not part of the Buddhist tradition. No, 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 the four, the, the four yogas that you listed, were they listed yes. in the Upanishads? Yes, you will find yeah. them in the Upanishads, and you will also find them in a later book called the Bhagavad Gita, which some people, scholars like to add on as an Upanishad, but it was written much later uh, uh, than the last Upanishad. Uh, so the main resources of the different types of yogic practice and also the philosophy of Vedanta are found in the Upanishads. And uh, let me explain a little bit further. You have the four yogas, the, uh, I beg your pardon, the four different Vedas. And each of the Vedas has four parts. So it's like a matrix of 16. The last part of all the four Vedas are called the Upanishads, which means near sitting, near sitting the disciple with its uh, teacher. And the Non, and most of those Upanishads are dialogues between a student and a teacher, and they're wonderful to read. And the, uh, they, and the, the Upanishads are basically non-dualistic. The other three parts of the Vedas reflect the religious, dualistic, religious practices in the temples of India at that time, and how there was an evolution from the ritual dualistic practices in the development of the Upanishads. And that's where they came in. Uh, I kind of got lost from uh, now. So I hope that gives a context to where the source of the information came from. I, I think it does. Okay. I have a question for you. Hold on, please. There you go. Okay. Uh, this is Ginat. Let me show myself. Hello. So um, living in Israel as I do and being Jewish, I wonder if you are familiar with the teachings of Maimonides, of the Rambam. If you've oh, yes, of course. The great, <laughs> the great Maimonides, of course. So I wonder if you include him in your, in your analysis. Um, You've spoken about such wonderful minds and great ideas. And I just wonder if you have any co comment or knowledge or uh, way to include my mind. Well, I got to tell you how I'm responding to that. Uh, you know, I, I am such an admirer of him and his works, uh, but I'm not a scholar of my mind. I, I, I'm in that trap of studying comparative religion and it's endless the amount of material to study. And I don't recall exactly uh, uh, my mom and he's addressing duality and non-duality the way I've been doing it. That doesn't mean he didn't, because my uh, scholarship time with him is limited, but I wouldn't be a bit surprised uh, uh, because he was such a universalist type of thinker and so open. And so my guess would be, he. Uh, now I'm curious, I will take it upon myself to do a little digging. Thank you for asking that question. I never 
really focused on him and this question, like I did with Immanuel Kant and John Scotus and St. John of the Cross and these other people who definitely wrote and delved into it. And so I really can't answer your question, except you mentioned a name that I tre treasure and I will, well, I'll get back to you. I'm going to really do that. Well, that's Sorry. true. We have uh, three in a row that we're saying we want our speakers to come back. Someone else is speaking. I have one other question, which is, um, I wonder if it's possible to meditate on non-change, on, on the concept of something not changing. I mean, I can't wrap my mind around. Yeah, this is really a challenging question because <laughs> everything in our world changes. Nothing stays the same. The scientists tell us the sun's going to burn out and become a, a dwarf in five billion years. So, so what doesn't change? Now, that's really something. And, uh, and what's really a problem with that is we only have a du dualistic language to answer that question. And everything that's dualistic is changing. So we're in a trap. I've been a fraud in a way during this whole lecture. I'm using a subject object language to try to explain where subject object doesn't exist. <laughs> but I'm trapped. I have to be yeah. allowed to cheat a little bit. Yeah. Uh, I would, I, I tell you what I really love. The Kabbalah, the Kabbalists, I'll go to Israel. They had a wonderful, you know, they have different levels of consciousness about reality. They have the Ein, the Ein Sof, and the Ein Sof Ur. Now, the Ein Sof Ur is the point of emanation of the non-dual reality that, that created the Ten Sephirot, the Tree of Life. Ein Sof is nothingness, but that's not the ultimate. Ein is the ultimate, and Ein is defined as that which is beyond nothingness. So okay. meditate on what's beyond nothingness. I love that. It's so outrageous. It's outrageous. <laughs> You're laughing too. That's wonderful. So I would urge you to think of the Kabbalists, the Ein, and what is beyond nothingness. Beyond nothing. And another thing, meditation that's good, is the visualization of climbing from Malakuth, the lowest level of the tree of life, and climbing the tree up to Keter, which is the entry point to the absolute. And of course, you know, it makes a circle because Malchut is, and Keter is, Keter is the crown and Malchut is the kingdom. So they're connected. Yeah. Or oh, you could have a wonderful time on this business. We um, have another that's what I mean. I know if Carl also is wanting to speak. And someone I'm else. Sorry. Uh, I see Carl is. Okay. Himself. Maybe yeah. he has a question. Yeah, I was, I was just going to add that asking the question of what doesn't change in this infinite world is you could ask a similar question is what is not moving? Because there's yeah. nothing that's not moving. You can look at a well, we're all traveling around the sun at an incredible speed right now. So we're all moving. And if you, I went through an experience. So I'm going to put one experience here that I've had when I was trying to explain the, um, the difference between uh, time and space. So I was at camp and I was thinking about this. And so let's say I'm 12 steps away from the blackboard. And that's what was what I was thinking. And so I said, okay, if I go six steps, I'm now six steps away from the backboard. But if it, at that time, when I get to that sixth step, I'm half as tall as I was before, and have half the stride, I'm still 12 steps to, <laughs> to it. So what I started thinking was I could keep doing this. I'll never get to the blackboard if I keep getting half the, half the size. So then I thought maybe I could go inside my body and find my center. So I decided to try to do that. So I picked out a spot around my navel 
um, might be the horror of whatever, you know, but I picked the spot. I went inside and I meditated on that to find the cell and then inside that an atom that I found and I said, this is the center. So I'll go inside the nucleus of this atom. So I went inside of that. When I got inside of that, I saw what we now call subatomic particles, what Osawa called pre-atomic particles, but like quarks and things like that. So I could see those and I kept saying, well, if I get small enough, I can go inside of that. And then what can I see? And I saw the energy of vibration. So I had vibrational energy, which Osawa would say was the vibrational world. I went inside of that and I found what I now conceive of as pulsations, which are these tiny pulses that are just out and in, out and in, yin and yang, yin and yang, going at incredible speeds, faster than the speed of light, because we'd be able to see them if they were slower than the speed of light. So they're faster than the speed of light. Um, this is where I believe thoughts can be transmitted from one place to another. But anyway, um, so when you get, so then I said, what is beyond this and where could I go? And all of a sudden, I was beyond, as Alex said, you know, or Osawa said, I just went beyond thinking, you know, and just, just there was a, um, I, I can only describe it as an internal stillness. Nothing was moving. And I realized that's where the center is, where nothing moves. And then I thought, well, what if I had gone to a point inside my shoulder and found this center, I would get to the same center. And then I realized that if each of us were to do this, and each of us find our own center, we all wind up at the same center. So that's how we're all connected in my mind. But anyway, so now we're all um, connected. And then I said, well, there's no difference between the rock or the tree or anything else. The center of everything is that. So that's, um, I think in Alex's talk, the substratum of the universe is what that one that one infinite which i saw is just a, a light really um but there was no there was no movement there so i remember when herman was talking at camp once he talked about us being on one side and i think alex used the lake and going across the lake to the other side and he Herman used a river and he said, we're on one side of the river and we want to cross that river to the other side. And that's what we conceive of as heaven or whatever the other the other. So we want to cross the side to the other side. But he said, once you get to the other side, you realize there's no river <laughs> and there's no other side. So to me, there can't be two, because if there's, does that make sense? That there can't be two, it has to only be one, because if there's, the minute there's two, then anyway, I, I don't know if that Carl, makes sense. Carl, yeah. Carl you, you, you're struggling with that eternal problem of, you got to use a dualistic language to express yeah. the, the non-dual, and it's very difficult. Yeah, I, I, I concur. <laughs> I'll just make a quick comment. Thank you so much, Alex. It's a challenge for me. It's a struggle mm -hmm. to keep up with you, but it is so enjoyable to be given things to think about. And of course, as Carl just said, we only have dual language. So everything I've just said you know, is expressed in duality. And that is the challenge for our limited human mind 
to grasp something we we can only it's only in our consciousness which you know there's consciousness so that's my struggle and kathy one thing i wish i had emphasized a little more everything i'm saying all of these ideas are pointers they're trying to guide us toward liberation and the end of suffering they're pointers and even though they're dualistic pointers they're certainly helpful and I know the quality of my life has improved enormously over my 91 years compared to the way I was thinking when I was a teenager to the way I'm thinking today and all the stages in between, how much my worldview has changed. And I think looking back for the better. So I think it's all very worthwhile. Don't even be attached to finding the final answer. The main thing is to be on the journey. The journey is what counts and that transforms consciousness. Thank it's you. A, it's, about, you it's about experiencing rather than thinking it in my, in my own, for my own self. Um, if, I, if I'm starting to think about it, it's a different, um, I don't even know how to experience it, to, to say it, but um, you, I- You can, said it perfectly. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. I mean it, I mean it. That's exactly the, 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 the point. It's, it's ex so expanding that um, it has changed this way of, of being is um, kind of beyond uh, my experience of myself in, in our culture and in our society. And um, I, I think of it as, um, prelude to my next phase, which um, uh, is very exciting. Wonderful. Rebecca, was that you speaking, Rebecca West? That was Sharon Rothman. Oh, you're Sharon, right. And Rebecca West is on. Okay, thank you. And Alex, um, thank you so much. That was so excellent. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, uh, you know, as we age, uh, I'm so, you know, in awe of your abilities at 91. Uh, what advice do you have for us in 70s and 80s to, you know, to be like you? <laughs> well... <When> we <laughs> I'll go back to diet. My okay. parents were born. My parents were born in Greece. Came as immigrants to America, where I was born and my brothers were born. And we grew up on a Mediterranean diet before I ever heard of macrobiotics or it was popular in the press. So, and my mother and my father too were excellent cooks. And I realized I had a very, very healthy, nutritious upbringing. And we never had processed foods and every, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, it was just part of the culture. Uh, of course, we violate some macrobiotic rules, but that's okay. I don't feel bad. We eat nightshades and a few things like that. But, but fundamentally, I was blessed with uh, that. Uh, and also, I think the fact uh, I tried smoking when I was 13 years old, I didn't like it. It wasn't because I had wisdom or anything. I, I didn't pick up smoking. And, I, and uh, you know, and when I was 13 and 15, we're talking 1946, I was 15 years old. The Surgeon's General report about cancer and smoking came 15 years later. And so I was very blessed. My closest friends in high school did not smoke either. And not because we were smart, we just weren't interested. And so... I, I just had a couple of lucky breaks and karmic events that helped me a great deal to have reasonable shape. And uh, every day is a blessing. Every day is a gift right now. And, uh, but I got to tell you, uh, I am 91 and walking up the hill is tough. I like it on the flat. <laughs> uh, Did now? I answer your question, Carol? Yes, Alex, where do you live? Uh, I I came to Berkeley, California in 19, 
I finished high school in San Francisco and I came to Berkeley in 1950 as a student. And I never really left, but I did leave in a way because I married a wonderful Turkish woman 25 years ago and we spend most of our time now in Istanbul. And I come to Berkeley now as a tourist, but I'm a Berkeley guy, Berkeley University is my alma mater. And I taught in the community college system here for Wonderful. 45 years. Oh, blessing. Oh, that keeps you sharp, mentally sharp for sure. Yes. Yeah. So now you're back and forth to Istanbul. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, we try to spend the winters in Berkeley, but it's really funny. California, you know, it's supposed to be sunny California. Now we're having snowstorms here. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and I can't. <laughs> so. But of course, COVID is running our lives. I was in Istanbul for 20 months. I was afraid to travel. Oh, and, wow. Uh, so uh, travel, uh, COVID seems to be uh, running our lives. Yeah. Do, do you think it's still as prominent? I beg your pardon? Do you think it's still as pronounced and, and so, so cautionary right now? Yeah. Well, uh, we're, we're leaving for Istanbul on April 12th. <laughs> and I gotta, I'm gonna try and renew my driver's license before we get up, leave. Oh, very good. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you. I, I just like to add that Alex was talking about diet and stuff, but also he does walk uh, oh, every, yeah. every day. And when I visited him, he walked me up the hill. He walks every day and that's a chore. <laughs> That was a, a big hill. And and uh, so to have that, I think, is a blessing because even though it might be difficult, it is it does help one's uh, um, health. I keep looking for flatter places now, Carl. Oh, OK. <laughs> me, me too. Does the Bureau of <clears throat> Department of Vehicles, whatever it's called, do they have an age limit or do they just make sure that you could see? No, yeah, <laughs> you, you have it right. Because a friend of mine, a very good friend of mine, Beresford, who's a retired math professor from Berkeley, he renewed his license, but they double checked on his eyes because at one time he had some problems. I was lucky the last time I renewed my license five years ago, I had cataract operations before. And all my life, I had to wear glasses with a driver's license. Now I can drive without wearing glasses, but I wear them anyway, because they're also sunglasses. Alex, it's a pleasure. What can I tell you? I, it's, it brings me home, it brings me back. It's, it's very nice. So I, I really appreciate your joining us and I uh, look forward to more opportunities. Oh, of course. Thank you very much for inviting me. I love being with the group. And and I want to thank Carl for doing those French Meadow camps for 30 years that added so much to my life. You're, you're welcome. <laughs> we, had, we had a lot of help. <laughs> One of the great joys of being connected with the group is the wonderful people you make, meet, and friends. Mm -hmm. It, but don't. Yeah, you can record it, just don't show it. <laughs> anyway, um, basically, it goes back to before macrobiotics, before I had heard of anything spiritual or heard of spirals or anything. I was in at, at TCU, Texas Christian University, um, and I was studying philosophy and mathematics. So, um, I was trying to figure out space and time again. So it was the, the same thing, but it was it was way back well before macrobiotic practice. And um, I was I had climbed up. There was two pillars at the um, on University Drive going into what used to be the main um, administration building. There are two pillars about twelve foot high that 
I found out that you on one side, you could climb up some bushes and get up on the top of it. It was flat on the top. So I would sit up there late at night on the top and I would um, wait for people coming by, taking their dates home to see if I could pick up any good pickup lines. No, not really. But anyway, I was up on top of this, up on top of this uh, pillar, just sitting there and everything was very still that night. It just looked to me like everything was plastic. It looked like it could be uh, a child's um, scene where they put in different buildings and the trees. There was no wind blowing. There were no cars coming by. It was late at night. And I'm thinking about time and space. And I'm thinking of time as a succession of points that go one after another. And I'm going, okay, so we have this point, this second, this second, this moment, this moment, this moment. And then I said, well, maybe they go in a spiral instead of going in a um, straight line. So I have the, the points now are going in my mind in a spiral. And then I thought, well, what if from each point there's another spiral going out perpendicular to that one and then i thought what if uh, every point on every spiral had spiral had points going out of them in every direction um at the same time, and I've tried to do this again, and I've never gotten there, but all of a sudden at this time, when I when I thought of that, and I thought of all the spirals going, all of a sudden, just everything broke loose, and I was somewhere else. That's all I can explain. I was in an internal moment, which I can only call as an internal moment, and I was trying to think what happened during that time once it was very brief but after I came out of that I was trying to figure it out and what I realized was that I saw everybody past and future at the same time in other words I saw Plato, Aristotle, Shakespeare, Mozart, um, let's see Beethoven, Clemenceau, a lot of people that I had studied and seen, and I saw creatures that were, or people, I should say, or beings that were not of this incarnation. Anyway, anyway, I just saw all these different beings, and then I saw a big room, and everybody was in the room were like actors rehearsing their lines as if to come into history at some point where in in time so what i realized was there really is no time and there is only eternal time <laughs> there's not a past present and future we think of it that way because that's the only way we can conceive of where we are and what we're doing but i don't know if that makes sense to anybody but it's like it makes a lot of sense carl and the idea of uh, we are stuck again with the language and uh, when you have past present and future we're back stuck with a language that's dualistically trying to explain what science can't explain what is time and space they're having a hell of a time with that and even Einstein. And so I think you're right on target. Thank you. Thank you. It just, it was a, what I would call a transformative moment in which, you know, I, from that moment on, I've never had to worry because I, I experienced that moment. And once I experienced that moment, nothing else, everything else is, so, so to speak, um, what gravy <laughs> is basically just, you know, um, just more. 
So Carl, when you experienced that moment and yeah. did it create in you a knowing? Did it create, hey Phyllis, did, you, did that create in you a knowing about uh, what Alex is talking about, about uh, when we leave these physical bodies, we go to, or we are in the realm of oneness, all, all of these ideas. And the reason I ask is because all of my sort of philosophical teachings are that idea that that we're one together and that we are in a seeming duality at the moment. And sometimes I say, well, I don't know. How do I know? Sounds good. I want to believe that. Sometimes I just wonder, well, do I, can I really believe that? And so I'm asking after this experience, is that something that you know? And also to Alex, the same question. Okay, so basically, <clears throat> yeah, so, so first I'm gonna just tell you what happened afterwards, because I was really um, inspired, it's the only word I could think of, but I mean, I was really um, high, so to speak, from all of this. And, and so I went and, told my friends, you know, try to tell my friends, try to explain it to them what happened. And, um, you know, their response was basically, yeah, we've had bad acid trips too, you know? And I went, okay, I, wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't on anything, you know, I wasn't, I was just, you know, meditating, but they couldn't understand. So I did tell Herman and uh, about it and, uh, I asked him about it and he said he said yeah it's it's it sounds like you got there is what he said and I said why can't we stay there longer why can't I get back there in you know and you know now I know the reason is because I'm trying to use my mind to get back there and that's not the way but um you've got to quiet the mind uh, which is hard for me to do because I'm very mind oriented. But anyway, um, so and and his response was because we're human, and that was his response. We can't, you know. So it, he said, you you just have to appreciate those moments of what I I call a moment of grace, where it just it just happened. And like I say, it was I can't say it was because of macrobiotics. The second one obviously was after I was macrobiotic that I described earlier about getting smaller and smaller and smaller till you basically um, get to nothingness, stillness, emptiness, you know, but either way you get to some sense of eternity. Um, does that help? So that, that gives you a continuing sense of knowing where we come from, where we're going, who we are. Um, I it's a it's a knowing in a non-knowing way. I don't know how to explain it. Um, it's a uh, I mean, do I still worry about things from time to time? Yes, of course, every all of us do, don't we? Um, but I just have a, it's like I don't worry about it anymore. I don't worry about those things anymore. I don't know, that's the only conclusion I draw from it. Um, I don't know, Alex, do you have something to add there? Uh, uh... When it comes to worry, I used to be the gold medal winner, worried, worried about everything. And but I see growth as a, like a batting average. You know, uh, uh, I wasn't doing very well. I tended to worry, and uh, and so I was batting like one hundred. And now I'm batting around two twenty. One thousand is the goal, <laughs> because all worry. And concerns are based on our grasping and our attachments. 
-hmm. And when I, I find when I, one thing, the path has helped me a lot. If I tend to go too fast, I'm a type A type personality and uh, do it yesterday type. And that's, uh, so if I've learned to slow down, the worries disappear. When I really think about, yes, the worst is going to happen. I will die. This body is temporary. I believe in consciousness goes on. And uh, the uh, and I think I'm going to need several more reincarnations before I get liberated because I still have too many attachments and that's okay. And not to judge that because that makes the trap even worse. So my main practice is to slow down and um, this is the one thing uh, I have great support from my wife because she gets very impatient with me with my inability to slow down so lots of time. Don't jump is something I hear a lot. And she's right. And it's very helpful for me to have a reminder. That's why it's good to have a sangha and to meditate and be with people of like mind to remind us of what we already know. I know all this stuff. I just forget. I don't stop long enough to practice it 100% of the time. And I'm working on increasing that percentage. Mm. Phyllis, you were unmuted for a moment. Did you want to speak to unmute yourself again? I guess. Yeah, thank you. I didn't know the protocol. Um, well, I guess I could just be brief with a brief description of introduction because I'm going to say something that might shock a few people. I have lived my life as a contrarian. I actually never take the right path. I take the left-handed path. So I just want to throw these two concepts in. I know Carl has a background in academic philosophy, so do I. So when we have disagreements, we understand what we're disagreeing about. <laughs> but if you're not trained in academic Western philosophy, um, you might find that not having an answer is uncomfortable. But if you're a philosopher of any stripe, you know there's no knowledge, there's only questions. So I'm gonna throw out two concepts from the history of literature, academic, philosophical literature um, that comes from two separate places just for fun because philosophy is intellectual entertainment in my opinion. Okay, here's one, macro, micro. So when Carl's sitting high up on his mountain and he sees the totality of it all, that's micro, my, macrocosm. But when you look at people's faces and you realize they're getting older and then they die, that's microcosm. So there may be time in one area that you identify as time based on faces, but you look at the big picture and maybe there's no time. We don't know. Will we ever? I have no idea. The other concept is one thing, 10,000 things, which I think is kind of an interesting concept. You know, you start out with God and then you get all this mishigas. So I think um, you can play around with that as long as you want to. I like lifelong learning, but I really wouldn't call it worry. Um, Will we die knowing nothing? Possibly. Will our life ever have meaning? Who cares? We're here. We should enjoy it. I mean, will we ever get to the bottom line? Zip, you got it. It's in a box. Okay, that should take away. Now you can leave. I don't know. Everybody does everything differently. I don't think there's a rule. Uh, a lot of philosophers spend their entire lives. You, I got 2,000 books here, most of which I read. And they all have their bottom lines, but maybe they reversed it by the time they got to death's door. <laughs> anyway, I think philosophy should be treated as questions. Ask a question, get an answer, ask another question. That's my haiku. And um, 
just have fun with it because what else are you going to do while you're here for how many years? You got to have entertainment, right? Okay, enough of that. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Phyllis, Phyllis, can I ask you a question? Sure, go right ahead. I'll Phyllis, try. How did you, how, how did you uh, get into being a contrarian and what were your steps? How were you, you know, the two part question, how were you inclined to get into contrarianism? And then once you decided that, what were the steps involved? Well, like you said, that's a two part question. It requires intellectualization and analysis. I can honestly tell you, no one has ever asked me that question, but here's the bottom line, short and sweet. My father was a, an immigrant from Croatia and my mother was second generation German and they were both teachers. And we're talking about the 1940s. So completely different educational system from young people today. And um, I was trained by my parents to not go along with the crowd. Does that make sense to you? Sure, sure, sure. And then what you because think? I say, I say, sure it does. The, the Germans gave the US the, the form of the research university. Okay, but you asked me a question about how did I become a contrarian? Right. And I'm telling you that it was just in my family. There you that go. the message that I got as a child was, don't worry if people don't like you, do your own thing. Focus, focus, focus. Here's what you need to know about living and try and stay on the track. So right. I don't know, it's just natural. But then a philosopher teacher got a hold of me and I guess he realized I had a propensity for argument and that I could be trained. So he took me in and taught me Plato. And, you know, I was at school for years and years and years. And, and I just kept going. And what I wanted to say to Alex is if you haven't heard about Peter Kingsley, he proved that Plato lied based on documents that he found in Baghdad. So the Western world is based on a lie. And that's why the contrast between complementary opposites and opposing opposites exists in our thinking. And to quote George Carlin, it's why we're all effed up. <laughs> but I think trying to make sense out of it is really going to exhaust you. You have to keep eating your sea vegetables to keep up with it. <laughs> yeah that's that's what makes being a professional contrarian uh, so easy going you see uh, it, it, you follow that strictly you say you know whatever advice you're given you know that's fine i'm just going to do the opposite and and away you go you, and there's no complication well, are you a contrarian also? No, no. One of our one of our good buddies. One of our good buddies is. He was a uh, uh, he was uh, accepted at the Naval Academy. Uh, he turned it down. <laughs> he turned it down. I, I he became uh, a uh, uh, a flyer, I, 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 and uh, and. Uh, he just uh, he was given an order: do not go searching uh, for uh, the uh, opposition's um, uh, uh, test missiles, and uh, he found uh, you know he disobeyed that order <laughs> too, and uh, and uh, the, the, that was the pattern of the of his entire adult life. He's still around uh, with us today. The military is an interesting example, in just a short aside, my father was a military man until 1949. So for my entire childhood, he was stationed in various places and he ended up in Japan, which is what I think 
the reason why I really got into macrobiotics is because he had a history in Japan that I learned as a child. And we had objects in our house because he traded cigars, uh, cigarettes for artifacts. So I actually had an Asian museum in my house. So I learned a lot about Asian philosophy because that was his history. But he went up against MacArthur. He was a major. He said, I'm not executing any of MacArthur's orders. I'll write my own. So he did and ended up saving my brother's life during Vietnam. But, um, you know, he just was a contrarian from the get go because he was a Croat. I mean, it's sort of like, no, I don't do that. That's just it. Try and court martial me if you can. <laughs> I, don't know. I was just, you know, he beat them too. But I was just, you know, in that milieu. And I, I consider myself to be a reasonable contrarian. It's sort of like <laughs> investing your money. You look at what they're saying, you try and figure out what's true there, what's true over here, and then you make a decision. I mean, I just don't automatically take oh, yeah. That's yeah. nice. I'm not a complete, well, yes, I'm a radical, but you know, I'm not a nuts radical. I don't just radical because I radical. I have to think about it. Well, well, our our buddy, our, our buddy went whole hog, uh, you know, his entire his entire life. <laughs> yeah, I know people like that too. Yeah. Well, thank you for the question. That was challenging. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'll, I'll just add that it's really nice to see Phyllis. Uh, she and I have had many um, emails back and forth and articles for the magazine. There is one coming up by Phyllis in the in the March issue. So, um, you know, uh, that's coming up. But it's really nice to see you. Um, we've had this dialogue going on and and uh, yeah, for for years. And it's it's great. Well, thank you for daring to me to, daring to publish that piece of contrarian left-handed Michigas, and I think it'll make some people angry. But hey, it's it's logical. If it's not, let me know. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. So we'll again <laughs> finish the, the formal part of our presentation. And then we will talk some more. Back on this. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> yeah, I, since I'm again. since I'm interrupting, I'll just say like <laughs> a tree. What's the purpose of a tree? A tree's purpose is to be a tree, right? And it reproduces. That's part of what it is. And it plays, or it is, or it it doesn't do anything on, like, I don't know. I mean, we're not trees, of course. I don't know, Carl. Go ahead. Well, I was I was going to say something about a tree as well. So when Fukuoka came, everybody knows Fukuoka, author of One Straw Revolution and Natural Farming. Anyway, when he came to camp in uh, 79 and <clears throat> he gave a lecture and he asked us all to look at a tree and it turned out it was the Doeen tree. If those of you who have been to camp, there's a huge tree that Doeen has done, done under every morning. And he asked us to look at that tree. And he said, what do you see? And we all sat there and somebody finally said, a tree. And he said, now imagine that you're a baby, but you can see with the eyes that you have, but what do you see? He said, you see infinity. You see everything because you don't know that the tree is separate from the clouds or the ground or anything else. So you're seeing everything. So to me, from that moment on, I realized that we're all born with supreme judgment. We're all born with it. We have it all the time. We can never lose it. Um, you know, one book I picked up one time was How to Avoid Reincarnation. And um, I, I, I just had to buy it, of course, 
uh, self-title um, didn't turn out to be as good as I thought. But anyway, um, where was I going in this? Anyway. <laughs> Macro so, Mike. About huh? the tree is infinity. The baby yeah, is so, so basically we have, we're all have supreme judgment all the time. We're all connected whether we realize it or not. Is that, you know, that's the way I, I see it. You just, you know. If that supreme judgment is inherent in a child, in an infant, which I fully concur is there, yeah, it occurs before there's an eye. And before we've made the eye as separate. So the infant sees everything as being vibration, as color, as form, formless, etc. Uh, mm -hmm. So when grandpa walks in, that's no different than the curtains. That's no different than the music. That's no different. It's all energy or vibration because there's no eye whatsoever. Even if grandpa holds us and says, you're so strong, you know, you're just a coil when you grab something. You're just a spontaneous clamp to hold on to the rattle. You're not so strong at all, right? Yeah. Because you and the clamp aren't even different at that point. You and grandpa aren't separate at that point. Right? Right. But then we, we get made into an eye and we're formed into believing that not only is that eye significant or special or important, but it's Jewish. It's French, right? <laughs> it, it's something more than just we get a shirt with a little blue boat. And now we're really in favor of the Mets much more than the Yankees. And we learn to hold hands and we become part of something and try to feel like we belong because that supreme level has disappeared from our experience. It's covered up by the identity of I. Huh? Mm -hmm. Well, well said. Yeah, so the more we can disidentify with that I, um, the more we might be able to realize something other than the I. There's a, I think, a, a group that I just saw the email from you, Gennad, about the conference on death. Uh, maybe a quick story that was be shared in that conference, but a Tolku, which is a Rinpoche who has a great experience of his own birth and his previous life, uh, was once in a retreat that I attended and the subject of death was on, the, on the, the cards. People were talking about death and he was just smiling and laughing the whole time. And then the emotions around fear came up about people being afraid to die. And someone in the Sangha said, uh, Rinpoche, do you have any fear of, of dying? Is there's like, no, you don't have any fear of the end of your life? And he just cracked up laughing even more, which as most people can relate, when a spiritual teacher starts to laugh like that, everybody in the room laughs except no one knows exactly why they're really laughing, except the other guy's laughing. So he wasn't, he, he was sure why he was laughing, but no one else knew why they were laughing. And then he stopped and looked around and he said, my mother had a baby and I came out of that woman's womb. And when that occurred, there was a document and that document put the name which I had and the place and the time and the parents' name. Then later, I showed up. But for me, I, to be afraid of dying, would mean I was born. Do you really think I exist? It was really great. Everyone yeah. understood. <laughs> Everyone understood. Later, I showed up. 
but in the very beginning of our experience on this plane, I don't exist. I is made up. Wow. And we believe it. Uh, I'll put in a plug. I'll oh, just okay. put in a quick plug that the next forum, the upcoming forum in April, April 2nd, is the whole time is devoted to our understanding, ideas, concepts, experience of death. Hmm. To quote a friend of mine, I was at a party. She was from Europe. Long story short. Anyway, she spent her entire investment getting Jews out of Germany. And um, we were having a party and we were sitting around talking about philosophy. And she leans across the table and she goes, in spite of philosophy, have something to eat. <laughs> This is encroaching on my lunch time. I think I'm going to have to go now. <laughs> this is uh, uh, almost like, uh, other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how did you enjoy the play? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, folks. I'm off to jump in the ocean behind me. Oh, <laughs> yeah, you know, I thought that was one of those fake backgrounds until I saw a yeah, bird fly by. It's not. I'm in Cabo San Lucas. <laughs> oh wow! Oh, I got I, I got out of, I got out of Dodge when I saw the uh, uh, snowstorm approaching. <laughs> well, we Bye, could end everyone. the recording again. I won't even bother. <laughs> oh, oh <laughs> I'm going to end mine. Thanks, thanks, Carl, Bye, Bill. Phyllis, Thank Alex, you. especially. And thanks, Gennad. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everybody. I'm going to. All right, then. Thank you. All right. Good night. Every. I mean, goodbye. <laughs>